coming to our joint seminar by Department of English and the Research Center for Professional Communication in English at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, my name is William Fang from the Department of English and also serving as uh, Associate Director of uh, the Research Center for Professional Communication in English. So uh, uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Mark Nazi to speak for us for uh, the Research Center uh, as well as the Department. So uh, Dr. Mark Nazi, uh, who is a Hong Kong Polytechnic University Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellowship in the Department of English. Uh, his research is mainly on corpus linguistics and critical discourse analysis. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, he graduated from uh, PolyU, from our department. And uh, uh, during uh, his PhD uh, in the last uh, four years, five years, uh, he has uh, produced uh, uh, over a dozen articles and he's very productive. And most of these uh, papers are really exciting uh, cutting edge research appearing in prestigious journals like Copra, Discourse and Communication, Critical Discourse Studies, and Language and Intercultural Communication. And the topics he uh, has studied include uh, different kinds of professional communication in uh, various uh, contexts in Ghana, in China, uh, in Australia, and UK. So today he's going to share with us uh, his recent research on emancipatory discourse in action, a feminist critical discourse analysis of Ghanaian feminist blogs. So now let's welcome Mark. Thank you very much, Dr. William Fang, for the kind introduction. Many thanks to the department and the Research Center for Professional Communication in English for the opportunity to share. And lots of thanks to you all for attending this talk, which I've titled Emancipatory Discourses in Action a feminist critical discourse analysis of Ghanaian feminist blogs. Here is an outline of my presentation. I'll introduce the study and present the framework and methods. This will prepare the ground for the findings and discussion. I will conclude by highlighting the implications of the study. I broadly situate my study within the context of research on non-dominant groups. So I'll begin by explaining this term. Non-dominant groups are socially, not numerically defined. Their definition considers issues of race, ethnicity, sex or gender, sexuality, age, religion, indigeneity, disability, among others. They are generally groups of people with less power and privileges, as well as lower socioeconomic status compared to a dominant group. Typically, the members of this group suffer unequal treatment, discrimination and stigmatization owing to stratification in society. And they are less likely to be favored by the institutions of society. Dworkin and Dworkin 1999 identified four main characteristics of non-dominant groups and I'll briefly I'll run through them. The first is identifiability, which points to the view that the members of this group have a conspicuous or a noticeable presence in society, hence they can be easily identified. Two, differential power, suggesting that the members of this group have less power and lower socioeconomic status in comparison with a dominant group. Three, differential and pejorative treatment, meaning that the members of this group often or typically receive different negative and unfair treatment. And finally, group awareness, i.e. the members of this group are self-conscious or self-aware of their non-dominant status and or minority identity. Some examples of non-dominant groups in various contexts include women, migrants, refugees and asylum seekers, ethnic, racial, and religious minorities, LGBTQ people, indigenous people, elderly people, persons with disability, etc., etc. Research on 
women as a non-dominant group in various uh, contexts have highlighted the following, suppression and repression, sexism, commodification and objectification, patriarchy and gendered stereotypes. This scholarship sheds light on the activities and attributes typically associated with women, especially by the media and the major roles and identities that emerge from these associations. This body of knowledge also illustrates the discursive strategies of legitimation and delegitimation used in the production and reproduction of various forms of ordering and alterity against women, including alienization, homogenization, pejoration, stigmatization, scapegoating, moralizing, stereotyping, suppression, and silencing. The existing work on non-dominant groups in general, and women in particular, has focused mainly on discourses of repression and powerlessness, discriminatory exclusionist and prejudiced discourses, as well as the maintenance and perpetuation of dominance. Given this focus, the ways in which women construct or negotiate their own identity and resist hegemonic discourses directed against them is lacking in the discourse studies literature. That is, there is a paucity of studies on the voice and agency of women, including their resistance discourses, their positive self-presentation, and their solidarity formations for group empowerment. I submit that such research is needed to highlight emancipatory discourses and the reconstruction of resistance as an objective of CDA research less emphasized in the literature. And as the recent Black Lives Movement has emphasized, it is necessary to center marginalized voices, especially Black voices, as part of efforts to shape attitudes towards oppressed people. The present study sets out to do this. To provide some context, I will highlight some areas where gender inequality is evident in Ghanaian society. For instance, even though women in Ghana are given equal rights under the constitution, disparities in education, employment, socioeconomic status, and moral values for women are prevalent. Despite the progress that has been made for women empowerment in the last decade, there is a lack of female representation in government and women's participation in politics in Ghana is sometimes accompanied by denigration. There is also the correlation of a woman's worth with marriage and childbearing. And there are sexual double standards for men and women, especially with respect to a virgin identity. To tackle these issues, feminist organizations and women's rights groups have increased in recent years and efforts aimed at gender equality continue to grow in Ghana. The present paper contributes to these feminist efforts by highlighting how Ghanaian feminists utilize the affordances of online media to project their voice and construct or reconstruct a positive identity for themselves. Against this backdrop, the specific aims of the study are as follows. One, to analyze resistance strategies in the blog post of Ghanaian feminists in order to show how feminists remake gender relations in our world. Two, to discuss the role of language in promoting emancipatory and resistance discourses. And finally, to illustrate the function of discourse in feminist analytical activism. To achieve these objectives, I adopt Michelle Lazer's feminist critical discourse analysis. This framework combines insights from critical discourse analysis and feminist studies to interrogate discourses that perpetuate gendered social practices. It is a perspective that examines the complex, overt, and covert ways in which gendered assumptions are discursively produced sustained, negotiated, 
and challenge in various contexts with a focus on social justice and transformation Feminist critical discourse analysis aims to challenge discourses that entrench gendered social practices and structures that impinge on possibilities for men and women as human persons. Additionally, feminist critical discourse analysis is interested in issues of access to forms of discourse that can be empowering for women's participation in public domains. It is important to state that feminist critical discourse analysis is not simply the application of existing CDA approaches to analyze gender or gender issues, since FCDA is fundamentally driven by developments in critical feminist theory and is shaped by what Vicky Bell refers to as a feminist political imagination. Uh, Michelle Laser articulates five key interrelated principles of feminist critical discourse analysis as theory and practice. And I'll briefly denulate these principles. The first is feminist analytical activism, which points to the view that feminist critical discourse analysis is a feminist political critique of gendered social practices and relations aimed at effecting social emancipation and transformation, thereby making FCDA a practice oriented approach. The second is gender as ideological structure and practice. That is how gender ideologically divides people into two classes, men and women, basically on, based on the hierarchical relation of domi domination and subordination respectively. The third is complexity of gender and power relations. And in this regard, FCDA views gender as interconnected with other socially stratified identities based on race, sexuality, social class, among others. Hence, gender is not studied as an isolated category that overlooks other potentially relevant dimensions of social identity. And this leads to the idea of intersectionality. So in viewing the concept of gender, it is not perceived as an isolated or a homogeneous or a single uh, category. Instead, it is perceived as being intersected with other social identities. And the fourth is discourse in the construction or deconstruction of gender. That is viewing discourse as one of the key elements of social practices, and thus examining how gender ideology and gender relations of power get produced and reproduced, negotiated, and contested in text and talk. The final principle is critical reflexivity as praxis. That is how knowledge about social processes and structures can shape practices, thereby resulting in positive change, or how critical awareness can become a normal feature of people's everyday life. And I'll turn my attention to my data set and analytical framework or analytical procedure, I should say. The data for the study comprised 80 blog posts written by Ghanaian women who described themselves as feminists. Five blog posts were written by guest authors for whom one is unable to ascertain whether they are feminists or not. Nonetheless, these articles had a feminist orientation since the authors were writing for a feminist blog. The blog posts were purposively sampled based on the intersectional approach they adopt and based on the ascendry of Ghanaian women's voices and their feminist activist stance. The blogs from which the data were collected include the following, ghanafeminism.com, justnanaama.com, kwechiwesdiary.com, pepperdenministries.com, lydiaforson.com, facebook.com forward slash our collective V. The blogs were chosen based on their popularity. Based on the feminist orientation of the blogs, it can be said that their aim is to expose negative and constricting gender practices within the context of Ghana as part of a greater global movement for equity. To give you a feel of the data 
here are some of the titles of the blog post. I'll give you a minute to read them. Uh, just to explain a few things here, Otiko was a female ministerial nominee for gender, children, and social protection. So basically, uh, this uh, blog post, what a blog writer does is to praise her for resisting sexist comments directed at her during her vetting. And this counselor here, Counselor Lutrot, is a marriage counselor who has very strong and controversial views on women, dating, marriage, and relationships. For instance, according to him, if you are a woman and no man pursues you throughout the week, there's something wrong with you. He also insists that women must not marry poor men. So the, the blog writer considers his views to be baloney or borderdish. And this hashtag here, Shashi, is a Ghanaian derogatory term or a pejorative slang similar to slut, bitch, or prostitute, and it can be used to label women perceived to be promiscuous, or it can simply be used as an insulting remark directed at women. And this expression here, berima in Su, is a common expression in one of the Ghanaian languages that literally translates as men or boys or males don't cry. So it basically equates masculinity with toughness. So this is just to give you a sense of uh, the data I analyzed. The analytical procedure adopted was qualitative and it followed a three-stage process of identifying resistance strategies via a close reading of the blog post. Interpreting these strategies with recourse to the context of situation and available background information and explaining the impact or possible impact of these strategies on readers. The following criteria were adopted in identifying the resistance strategies. One expression of discontent with practices that reinforce gender social arrangement. Two, articulation of social justice for women and societal transformation. Three, communication of a feminist political action or imagination. Four, rejection of cultural devaluation. And finally, emphasis on access to forms of discourse that can be empowering for women's participation in public domains. The analysis revealed three main resistance strategies utilized in the blog post to oppose gender inequality and empower Ghanaian women, especially in African women in general. These strategies include critiquing patriarchy traditional gender norms and gender oppression, two resistant gender stereotypes and rewriting demeaning narratives. And finally, calling out sexist attitudes and applauding women who resist such behavior. Through these strategies, the blogs are used to perform social activism in the form of the promotion of critical awareness. I therefore argue that the issues interrogated in the blog post do not simply prepare the way for action, but constitute action in themselves. Since critical awareness, according to Michelle Laser, is a form of activism. I now discuss the first resistance strategy, critiquing patriarchy, traditional gender norms, 
and gender oppression. Even though Marsh Storovich and Larson assert that women and men across the globe continue to live with patriarchy, I submit that patriarchal practices are very dominant in African societies, including Ghana, thereby enabling the prevalence of traditional gender norms and gender oppression. The blogs st strongly criticize such systematic gendering of privilege and inequality by focusing on two issues. One, women's sexuality, and secondly, the issue of marriage and motherhood. So I'll look at these two issues and examine how the blocks engage with them. First, I'll look at the issue of women's sexuality. In extracts one to four, sexist gender norms and gender oppression that derive from patriarchy are exposed and criticized. Some of these sexist gender norms and gender oppressions include normalized sexual cohesion, male entitlement, victim blaming, slut shaming, and the policing of a woman's body and or clothing. Hence, the blog posts resist socially constructed views that seek to justify men's sexual freedom and women's sexual confinement. Given the gender-based sexual double standards evident in Ghanaian society, there is a coupling of puberty and high moral worth with a virgin identity for women, but not for men. Hence, being a virgin or appearing to be one can be said to be a necessary aspect of maintaining moral worth and avoiding ridicule, shame, and devaluation. The extracts confront this social construct that perpetuates men's dominance within society through normalized sexist attitudes and foreground the view that sexual double standards for men and women create a toxic climate conducive to women's exploitation. I therefore argue that the blocks from which the extracts were killed constitute a form of critical reflexivity as practices by raising critical awareness and giving voice, agency, and power to Ghanaian women in this particular context over their sexuality. The manifestation of patriarchal ideology in the idea of getting married and having children is also tackled in the blog post as demonstrated in extracts five to seven. Even though marital pressure exists for both men and women in Ghana, this pressure manifests differently. That is, women are largely socialized to desire marriage as a key indicator of a fulfilled life, while men are socialized to view marriage as an eventual but necessary step that will rid them of their boyhood freedoms. For instance, there is a societal expectation for women to get married in their 20s and have children by a certain age. But such an expectation is not necessarily foisted on men. The view that highly educated and or very successful women will have difficulty to find a husband is also held by many people, partially echoing Yatin Yu's submission on the notion of leftover women in Chinese society. Additionally, whether it is a fulfilling career or an attempt at vying for political office, Ghanaian women of a certain age are sometimes not accorded due respect or accepted unless they are married. Hence, extracts five to seven debunk the patriarchal gender ideology that makes women feel that failure to get married devalues their life, and more importantly, offer a transformative perspective of valuing women intrinsically, not on the basis of marriage or motherhood. Another means by which a feminist discourse practice manifests in the blog post is via the uncovering of gender stereotypes and redefining narratives that put Ghanaian and by extension African women at the periphery of society and devalue them. In this way, the blog function as a gender advocacy platform that puts gender on Ghana's agenda and probes into the structures operating within Ghanaian society that somehow leaves both 
genders imbalanced. I'll first discuss the bloc's resistance of gender stereotypes followed by how they rewrite negative or demeaning, demeaning gender narratives. In extracts 8 to 11 and throughout the entire data, a number of stereotypical notions are resisted. These views, which are often expressed in everyday conversations in Ghana, on social media and sometimes on radio and television, include women are their own enemies. Women have a victim mentality. Women stay in abusive relationships because of sex. Women are boyfriend and husband snatches. Women must love their abusers in order to change them. And it is normal for men to cheat. Other stereotypes that border on women's positioning as feminists include the following. Women feminists are ugly. Women feminists are just frustrated, bitter, and angry. And women feminists hate men. Importantly, the blog post not only render the various stereotypical notions untenable, but also offer a more nuanced counter perspective. For instance, with respect to extracts eight and nine, the blog post argue that some of the possible reasons why some Ghanaian women stay in abusive relationships include lack of financial security, psychological dominance, religious and cultural stigma, cycle of abuse, and fear. I submit that this more informed argument is extremely important because while it may be difficult to understand why some Ghanaian women stay in abusive relationships, is speculation or an assumption like their love for sex perpetuates myths and gender stereotypes that isolate victims even further. The blog post therefore tackle a miseducation in a manner that is empowering for women and hopefully corrects mindsets that enable and foster gender stereotypes. In extract 10, one of the main social narratives that seek to silence women's and Ghanaian feminist voice, especially on social media, is addressed. That is the view that women feminists are ugly. The underlying ideology here is that ugly is a devalued and repulsive state. It is where women are not allowed to be according to society's standards of beauty and social acceptability, and is therefore a space that feminists are pushed or shoved into as a mechanism to demean them. This narrative is, however, invalidated in the blog post and an intrinsic basis of self-worth, not based on arbitrary social standards or definition, is advanced. Within Ghanaian social cultural system, there is a widely held view that men, boys, or males must be tough, while women, girls, or females must be soft. This social narrative is challenged in extract 11, thereby underscoring the point that men, boys, or, or males, like all healthy human beings, can express a variety of emotions, including loneliness, sadness, or even a desire to be loved without fear of losing their masculinity or being stigmatized. In other words, the Black Post suggests that feminism allows men to escape certain gender roles for their own betterment, thereby opposing gendered social practices and relations. Apart from resisting gender stereotypes, the blog post prefer alternative perspectives by rewriting demeaning gender, gender narratives and reconceptualizing various issues that marginalize Ghanaian women. In extracts 12 to 14, various social narratives that devalue women are interrogated and reconceptualized to give voice and agency to a feminine perspective. Among other things, issues pertaining to beauty, physical appearance, sexual liberation, and the use of sexist metaphors are scrutinized and reconstructed to support the feminist goals of social emancipation and transformation. Therefore, the counter narratives, redefinitions, and interpretations given in the blog post can be understood 
as a form of analytical activism aimed at facilitating learning and learning and relearning of the narratives both males and females have been operating by in order to provide a better approach to socialization. The strong conviction with which the reconceptualization and redefinition of gendered issues in the extracts are communicated lends credence or credibility to the radical openness used to tackle women's exploitation and women's empowerment. And I'll discuss the third and final resistance strategy identified in the blog post, which is they are calling out sexist attitudes and misogynistic behavior in the media, especially by public figures, as well as commending or applauding or praising women whose actions directly or indirectly resist such behavior. The blogs therefore constitute a platform that openly takes on the system to the extent of exposing the prejudiced and discriminatory discourses of powerful members of the Ghanaian society. Extract 15 condemns the misogyny of a member of parliament for alleging that the chair of Ghana's electoral commission had traded sex for her position. Extract 16 exposes a clergyman whose comments in the media invariably reinforce sexism and misogyny. And Extract 17 calls out the sexist behavior of a chief. The specificity with which these individuals are identified and the fact that their names are mentioned illustrates boldness and an openness of conviction in voicing critique against practices and actions that seek to maintain hierarchical gender relations. By naming and shaming powerful individuals in Ghanaian society, the blog posts confront the system or institutions, including the media, religion, and culture that promote male chauvinism and serve to sustain the erasure of women's voices and presence from the public sphere. In addition to calling out sexist and misogynistic comments made by powerful members of the society, the blog post commend women whose actions actively and publicly resist such behavior as illustrated in extracts 18 to 20. Extract 18 praises a female ministerial nominee for refusing to count out in the face of subtle bullying by male panel members during her vetting by the parliamentary select committee. Given that the vetting committee meetings are broadcast live on national television and aired on radio, the activism performed by the blog post in pointing out how the female ministerial nominee projects her voice and agency is striking. Extract 19 commends a group of women for founding a gender advocacy group following sexist discussions on Ghanaian social media. And Extract 20 applauds a 19-year-old girl for reporting an ace Ghanaian broadcaster and celebrity to the police, accusing him of rape. I contend that by highlighting the courage and bravery of the women, the blogs function as a practice-oriented platform concerned with social transformation of the existing gender order and attitudinal change by both men and women. In conclusion, it is my view or my position that the practice orientation of the blocks notwithstanding, positive social change is not a once and for all achievement. Therefore, there is a need for a continuous striving informed by a feminine perspective of a just society in which interpersonal social relationships and people's sense of who they are or might become are not predetermined or mediated by gender. It is therefore essential for the emancipatory discourse promoted by the blogs to be combined with campaigns, public education, outreach programs, and engagement with relevant institutions or policymakers. In other words, it is important that the emancipatory discourse and positive change advocated in the blog post is not confined to the digital space, but is given practical implementation. And for our discourse analysts, given the marginalization of, given that the 
marginalization of women is accomplished through text, talk, and social practices, it is absolutely necessary and vital for discursive work to continue to be at the forefront of media studies and linguistics research. This study builds on existing work on the discursive construction of non-dominant groups in general, and women in particular, by shedding light on an aspect of their discursive positioning that has received little attention in the literature. It highlights work done or being done by social movements to dismantle oppressive gender role practices in Ghana and by extension Africa. It also centers marginalized voices in general and amplifies black voices in particular. Additionally, the insights abused in the study are instructive in tackling the gender issues affecting Ghanaian or African women. And finally, by focusing on a context underexplored in the literature, this study extends the scope of work on feminist critical discourse analysis. This study has just been published as an online first publication, so you can check it out if you're interested in further details of the study. Given the brevity of time, I didn't provide a comprehensive context for the examples and strategies that I discussed, so you can read the paper for further insight. Here are some selected references. Thank you for engaging with my talk. <laughs>